so there may be some overlap with um, Dr. Hovsepian's talk. I'm going to just do a clinical overview of lymphatic malformations. I guess the pointer uh, is no longer here. Um, okay. And this slide shows a variety of clinical presentations of uh, patients who had uh, lymphatic malformations. Um, I don't want to be repetitive, but um, you know they can be truncal or extra truncal, micro macrocystic, or combined with capillary venous malformations. Here's a patient who had um, very severe swelling of his uh, leg and recurrent cellulitis, and the toes felt like sandpaper, um, and he had. Um, oozing and, as I said, infections. They, it was socially a problem. He was constantly on antibiotics. Um, medical therapy with serolimus was offered to the family, and they uh, thus far are not agreeable to that, but I think they will turn the page as there's more experience with that medication. This is a child who presented with a large buttock, um, and it was found to be uh, lymphatic on MR. It also transilluminated. Uh, this is a patient with lymphatic malformation in the tongue. They often have uh, a raised area in the midline that uh, can look red. Sometimes there's bleeding into the blebs, um, and there can be um, problems with uh, halitosis, with feeding, with speech, with orthodonture. And if there's more involvement, um, there can be bony abnormalities as well with a bony overgrowth um, of the jaw. And this is a patient with uh, lymphatic malformation in, in the leg, and uh, so it's a deeper lymphatic malformation with um, superficial uh, blebs as well. Okay. Uh, and it, I gave a talk this morning on the evolution of the updated ISFA classification um, and went through the historical classifications. Uh, one of which was uh, more or less a staging system by Desaire, which um, categorized lymphatic, the cervicofacial lymphatic malformations based on the location. Um, and the you know, higher the stage, the more problematic uh, they could be, you know, with, um, in that they were predictive of the outcome and complications. And some people still use that and find uh, that there's clinical utility to that. Um, as Dr. Fazibiana mentioned, the um, no, no, uh, nomenclature of lymphatic mal malformations can be confusing in that they're often incorrectly referred to as cystic hygromas, lymphangiomas, hemangiomas, and that's because some of the lymphatic malformations appear red or blue due to intralesional hemorrhage or a combined lymphatic venous or capillary malformation. Um, we really reserve the term hemangioma for um, the hemangiomas of infancy. Um, so any adult patient that comes with a diagnosis of hemangioma, even if the pathology report and the radiology reports state hemangioma, that's incorrect. Um, lymphatic malformations can occur in any location. They are present at birth, but not only always evident. They can also be diagnosed prenatally. They can be isolated or associated with other vascular malformations and or syndromes. Um, this is a patient with uh, higher stage uh, lymphatic malformation and uh, lymphedema. This is a patient who had recurrent infection due to a lymphatic, lymphatic malformation of the chest and arm that was treated surgically. If we saw him now, we would probably treat him medically. And this is a patient who, interestingly, actually has an arteriovenous malformation, but um, it's associated with lymphedema, and what she has is macrocephaly, um, pa some papillary changes in her tongue, family history of thyroid disorders and cancers, and she herself has thyroid disorder, and she has the P10 mutation, which is a genomic mutation, um, and her father actually has the same thing, so he has macrocephaly. Um, and there's um, a, a screening uh, process that is recommended for these patients that they have very early and regular screening for malignancy. Um, but she actually had lymphedema associated with an AVM. And she was in the initial trial of serolimus for complicated vascular malformations. And clinically, 
personally, I didn't see much difference, and she felt a, a bit different, uh, improved, although compliance might have been an issue with, with her. Um, lymphatic malformations can be focal or diffuse. They can be subcutaneous or deep, and they also can intertwine with muscles or organs. So here's a patient who has uh, lymphedema and lymphatic malformation, um, a very severe case of lymphatic malformation of the tongue, and this is a newborn who was born with a large um, lymphatic malformation that actually did well with um, sclerotherapy, serial sclerotherapy. The pathogenesis of lymphatic malformations is not entirely apparent, but it's likely the result of developmental defects during embryonic lymphangiogenesis. And um, every year there's more research uh, that, uh, or results of research that is um, pointing us more in a direction of uh, how these are developing and um, ideally will help determine the best way to perhaps prevent proliferate, um, progression uh, and treat them more readily because the morbidity can be um, and is very devastating for the um, patients. Um, this slide demonstrates the progression over time in embryogenesis with the different um, cell type and precursor cells and different markers that are present. And this has been helpful um, clinically as well. Um, the identification of specific markers such as LIVE1, I don't know if he's still in the audience, but one of the authors of that paper is here. Uh, D240, protoplanin, VEGFC, and VEGFD has advanced the characterization of lymphatic tissue. And uh, as has been previously mentioned in Dr. Hovsepian's, and I'm sure many talks today, the lymphatic malformations are thin-walled, thin fluid filled cysts with a surrounding stroma and connective tissue. Um, and the lymphatic endothelium is confirmed with the immunochemical positivity with D240 and the other lymphatic-specific markers. And um, there's many papers that um, have demonstrated that there's, na there's many uh, nice illustrations of this as well. Prenatal diagnosis of lymphatic malformation is uh, readily available simply with an ultrasound. Um, they can be diagnosed early uh, in pregnancy. There is a high rate of aneuploidy, Turner syndrome being the most common. Um, those diagnosed prenatally may um, resolve, and if they're not too large, they may resolve spontaneously. Um, the marker and it, it can be a marker for other malformations. Uh, postnatal diagnosis um, would be, well, diagnosed late in pregnancy, if at all, is a ro low rate of aneuploidy, and it persists unless treated, variety of sites, and generally an isolated fi finding. Um, why it's important to diagnose these prenatally, depending on the location, is it can help with delivery planning so that if there is a large cervical facial lymphatic malformation, the recommendation would be an exit procedure, which is an ex utero intrapartum procedure where the partial delivery of the fetus via C-section occurs with subsequent management of the neonatal airway while oxygenation is provided via the placenta. So there's a whole team that uh, arrives at the a uh, delivery room that can be prepared to manage the airway of the baby, and um, um, if this is known ahead of time, it's a much smoother procedure. Uh, the question of in utero sclerotherapy has also come up, and is, that's not really ready for prime time at this point. Complications of lymphatic malformations um, can be, as I mentioned, dental malocclusion, uh, oral health, halitosis, fluid leakage with leaking blebs that can be um, not only unsightly but embarrassing uh, depending on the location. Um, there can be chylus or pleural fusions that Dr. Roxon will uh, discuss and Dr. Hovsepian mentioned. Gastrointestinal, there may be dietary restrictions. Um, peritonitis can occur, um, uh, chylocystitis. Hematologic, there can be lymphopenia. 
um, bleeding, infectious, cellulitis, uh, sepsis. There actually can also be warts. I've seen this in one or two patients uh, where there's actually um, a T cell immunodeficiency. You can have hypogammaglobulinemia and also a T cell deficiency um, and chronic warts in some of these patients. It's unusual, but when it occurs, it's very impressive. And of course, there can be obstruction mainly of the airway or vision. Uh, orthopedic issues are not minor. Uh, there can be pathologic fractures if um, it's an extensive situation or gorums um, or generalized lymphangiomatosis. Limb length or foot discrepancy or girth discrepancy uh, and, and or bony overgrowth. So again, these are medical issues because if they're not addressed, they can lead to uh, scoliosis and other orthopedic problems. Um, but also they can be embarrassing and unsightly for patients, um, as well as pain. The management of lymphatic malformations depends on the location and the type of lymphatic malformation, on uh, the extent. Uh, supportive can just be hygienic, which would be oral care to decrease bacterial flora because that can seed infections in the cervical facial areas. Um, sometimes, um, uh, serial antibiotics at low dose have been used prophylactically. Uh, complete decompressive lymphatic massage therapy, and if we're able to, <laughs> with the reimbursement <laughs> issues, use the uh, pump therapy here. Uh, custom made gradient support stockings, pneumotherapy, uh, and shoeing can be uh, an issue and often needs to be custom made or with discrepant sizing, and only certain stores enable you to buy one pair of shoes with two different sizes, namely Nordstrom. Uh, surgical problems, uh, surgical approaches can be um, accomplished with debulking or resection. Um, some of the tongue and intraoral lesions are addressed with ND YAG laser. Tracheotomy is um, often necessary. Um, pleurocentesis or paracentesis, sclerotherapy, um, and now there is more um, attention, actually, to medical therapy with the, uh, I have no experience with sildenafil. Stanford is where the clinical trial is being held, and we've heard mixed reviews, but I don't know the update of that. <laughs> it was an incidental finding. Um, but rapamycin, serolimus, has really um, taken the forefront in terms of treatment for these lesions. And when it works, it works. And actually, it seems to work best in my observation and the, that of others if there is a lymphatic component in a vascular anomaly. And it, it's, it's really quite impressive. Um, and there's some research that is suggesting propranolol, a beta blocker, uh, would be helpful in lymphatic malformation. I have not seen success, but, but in vitro, um, there seems to be a, a suggestion of success and, of course, combined therapies. Um, this is actually the same exact <laughs> um, paper that um, Dr. Hosepian had, had mentioned, so I, I, I think I'll skip over this, but uh, it, it compares the two different disorders, GLA and Gorham's. And, you know, what I will say is that these are not the most common disorders, so that's why we're going back to this one paper, because they were able to consolidate uh, as many cases as they could, um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's not that common, we don't think. And this was the slide, actually, that the, the image that was in that paper that showed um, the differences in the anatomic distribution of the bony involvement in the different disorders. So in Gorham's, um, it was more common in the cranium, clavicle, and ribs, um, and there were not as many bones involved, but there was severe involvement. And then in GLA, uh, more bones were affected and they were more in the, the spine, sacrum, and pelvis. Uh, this is a case of a child who came to me, he's about five years old, I think, and he came, he was referred by a surgeon actually, he had these blebs and his history is important for uh, the fact that when he was an infant, he was born with a big cystic lesion around uh, his um, 
scapula, and he had surgical resection, um, and the diagnosis was lymphatic malformation, and he was doing well for many years, and then he developed these blebs. And initially, all he had were blebs. There was no soft tissue fullness. Um, so I actually treated them with topical rapamycin, and he did very well for about eight, eight or nine months. Um, on and off topical rapamycin, but then he started to develop more blebs and more fullness, and then we did an MRI, and he had local recurrence of lymphatic malformation, um, which is going to be sclerosed, actually. Um, when you examine a patient with a lymphatic malformation, there's usually a soft fullness that transilluminates, and the MR imaging would um, be something like um, this, and Dr. Hovsepian um, had describe that, so there's, you know, cystic lesions, and this patient did very well with uh, sclerotherapy. This is a patient with lymphatic malformation of her um, buttocks with um, extension into um, deeper structures, and she had some sclerotherapy at another institution and developed actually urinary incontinence because of one of the cysts was compressing the ureter not incontinence, enabled, <laughs> inability to urinate. Um, and uh, so she ended up having another procedure. Uh, and now, so far she's been fine. We've discussed rapamycin with the family and we're holding off for now, but we've, um, we, I'm, I'm sure she's gonna end up going on that medication. I just saw her last week and she's roaming around. Uh, this patient is very interesting. She was born elsewhere, had lymphatic malformation. It extends all over her chest. She had surgery uh, when she was younger, and they removed um, the malformation on her chest, and now she has no breast on the left side. Um, she's had major issues with leaking, and um, she actually has good function of her hand, but it's this very, very bulky uh, arm. Uh, and uh, she actually hasn't had an infection there. She ultimately had some debulking, debulking surgery by Steve Fishman in Boston, um, and then her imaging shows she has extensive splenic involvement. And then we actually treated her with rapamycin, and I don't have the latest pictures, but now she's, it's like half a size and no leaking, and she's doing very well. So um, I think we'll go on to the next speaker. The timer is actually not working, so uh, it's, uh, I don't know. Um, in any event, Dr. Roxon will be next, and he'll talk about chylus fusions.